the original series problem. The original series was dialogue heavy. Um, this was because it came, original series came from, uh, get to it already, yes. The original series came from a period that was the fairly early days of television. And at that time, there were producers and writers who had come out of the radio era. And radio is, by nature, much more dialogue heavy. Uh, I am a huge audiophile, a big uh, fan of uh, what they call old-time radio, which is radio programs made from basically the turn of the century up until 1950s or so, with some that went afterwards. Um, so I'm very, very familiar how good audio drama works in terms of how it tells a story. And some of that bled over into the original series because of the time period in which it operated. And additionally, original series intentionally courted liber liter uh, literary science fiction authors because at that time, science fiction literature fans were dominant. They were the fandom. And it boosted the original series credit uh, in fandom of that era to have science fiction writers. However, writers like that write words where video is a visual medium. Half your story should be visual. You should be telling your story with what you see, especially with today's CGI. So original series was very dialogue heavy. It was also Star Trek is and has always leaned to. Yeah, Gunsmoke was a radio series. Absolutely. Yeah, there were all kinds of them that made the, the hop over. But Gunsmoke is certainly probably the most popular one from radio that made the leap over. Uh, Star Trek, in general, is always leaned towards the side of what we call hard science, science fiction. Um, the difference between hard science and si soft science science fiction would be, you know, Star Trek has always been hard science, and that means we spend time talking about the scientific stuff going on and explaining to the viewer how this or that other thing works. And the reason that we had to have this was show really started out as hard science uh, was because those literary fans of that era, and they were extreme sticklers for detail. If you were going to throw a universe like Star Trek at them, it had to make internal sense. And so, for example, just an example of how much of a stickler they were for detail at that time. After writing his rather amazing novel, Ringworld, Larry Niven was greeted at the next con that he was a guest at with a big banner which read, The Ring World is Unstable, that was held up by a bunch of MIT students who'd done the math and proved that Niven's Ring World had an unstable rotation. And so Niven then went on to write the sequel, The Ring World Engineers, in which he specifically addressed this problem of the Ring World's uh, unstable rotation. Warp drive makes sense. Well, Oddly enough, I'm about to speak about that. Specifically, great minds think alike. In that area, you couldn't just wave your hand at warp drive. It was a matter-antimatter reactor. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Dilithium crystals, however, were the key to making it work. Now, this was largely scientifically accurate in as much as the only thing that can, at, at our present level of technology, the only thing we can imagine that would power a faster-than-light drive would be something horrifyingly large, uh, in terms of energy production, like a matter-antimatter uh, reactor. Um, we don't have dilithium. That was the bit of hand wavium that they threw at it and said, it's the one key ingredient that makes it all work. But because they were showing us a, you know, a notion of a faster-than-light travel that made some sense and was internally consistent about how it worked with the power that it had, literary fans of that time let it go by. So... Uh, in reality, in, in real science, no faster-than-light drive makes sense at all. Um, you can theorize some ways to do it, but those ways that you can do it are so far beyond what we can do technologically that it doesn't matter. If you're going to have interstellar travel that isn't going to be you know, years, decades, hundreds of years in the making, you have to say, uh, there's some kind of faster-than-light drive. Don't look over here too closely at it. Um, there is no science fiction where that kind of drive makes a hell of a lot of sense in real science. So the science fiction fans of that time would allow you to do the warp drive that way. Um, they would say, okay, we'll, we, it makes sense uh, on the surface. We'll go ahead and let you have that, that little hand, bit of hand wavium uh, with um, uh, dilithium crystals. So. 
Other things in the original series were the limited effects by today's standards. And I say by today's standards simply because the special effects weren't capable of doing what modern CGI can do. In point of fact, they were absolutely groundbreaking at the time. But they were certainly like nothing like we, we could do today. And they were limited by what you're seeing here. A six-foot model that was a beautiful model, by the way. It's now been restored and rests at the Smithsonian Institute to National Air and Space Museum. Please go feel free, feel free to go get it and take a look at it. Yeah, Next Gen had a ship powered by a singularity. That was the Romulans. Yeah, a completely different way of doing it, which, um, if you don't look too hard at it, makes perfect sense. Yeah, okay. You could have a singularity running your faster than light drive. It'd be totally different, but yeah, you could do that. Again, we have a little bit of hand wavy them. You know, n none of this really makes sense in the real world, but if you're going to have faster than light travel, then you need to have a little bit of hand wavy them. But again, all the special effects you're doing were limited by what you're seeing here. You know, you were limited by what you could do with the technology of that time. The special effects on Star Trek, much as people like to malign them today, were very groundbreaking at the time. Um, they're just nothing like what we can do today. There was also limited direction and cinematography in the original series. While they made extremely good use of what they had, and sometimes it was awfully creative, the reality is that the camera technology of the time was looking like what I'm showing you here. That big, monstrous, heavy, 35 millimeter film camera rig could not go everywhere and do everything. If you were going to dolly that sucker, you had to lay down dolly track and make sure that it worked right. And they did. They oftentimes did. But you weren't going to pan that sucker everywhere and have it floating around the screen. It was impossible. The, the picture was largely static because you couldn't do any more. They were also limited by budget to some extent. Now, this was a pretty good budget for that era. It was about 190 k per episode. If you translated that into modern dollars, it's about $3.3 .3 million per episode. Uh, I couldn't find it, uh, a specific figure, but I believe the Orville is probably somewhere between 3 and $5 million on their budget. So while the special effects, you know, and stuff, and the, and the way the scenic design and all that looks kind of fake and hokey today, it was still the best estimation of the future that they could make from a 1960s perspective. Uh, I'll speak about that uh, technology in a second, but you have to remember this was not intentionally bad. This was what they could think of from the 1960s. If you went back in time to the 1960s with no knowledge of what was the coming technologies, you would get it wrong too. Ah, fan films, there he says, as I said, are just as good as the pros in production quality. Yes, yes, that's exactly the case. In their case, it's not so much of a problem uh, because they're intentionally doing things that are aping some of classic Star Trek. Here it becomes more of a problem, in my opinion. Another thing you have to worry about, uh, because in the original series, limited time. They're working on a very, very hard deadline at that time. Five to six working days. Uh, and sometimes they, they would often run, run over to seven days to make it an episode. But five to six is what they were supposed to have. And it was a hard date. At one point in the original series, they actually ran so far behind that Gene Roddenberry was afraid that they would not be able to deliver an episode one week. Now, while that does not seem like a big deal today, that happens from time to time in television today. Back then, that was death. If you failed the whole point of a producer's job, the producer's job was to make sure that an episode showed up before they had to air it at the network. That was the producer's whole job. If you couldn't do that, if Roddenberry had actually gone to NBC and said, I'm not going to be able to make it this week, he would never have produced anything ever again, anywhere, for anyone. The producer's whole job was to make sure that that episode made it there on time and preferably under budget. So they had this problem. They were going to run an entire week late, and they were not going to have an episode. Roddenberry went to the guy at the studio, who is his superior, and said, "Oh my God, we got to tell the uh, we got to tell the network." And he said, "No, we don't either. Do not say word one." And what they did was they sat down and they looked at the footage they had from the first pilot, The Cage, which had not aired, and has a very different cast. And they said, "Okay, Gene, here's what we do: we build a framing story around that." 
and then we work that one in. So what they actually were then able to do was to uh, create a two-part episode where there had only been one, and the, the, the parts that they had to film were not an entire week long. So they ended up with two episodes handing off to the network when they thought they were going to have none. And so they wound up not only getting back on schedule, but in such a way that they could afford to, uh, you know, be a little behind. So that was an extremely tight date. They could not miss those dates at that time. Technology always dates. Um, I've said it a million times before in my Monday reviews where I tend to review older films. Technology always dates. Always, 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 always. It doesn't matter what you think is really cool right now. When you come back in 15, 20 years or more, people are going to look at it and they're going to laugh. That's what Star Trek had. It's what everything has had. What science fiction, this, again, you have to remember, this was, this was really what the best futurists of science fiction of that era, and some scientists, for that matter, thought that the future would look like. What they didn't foresee was that general purpose computers would become so powerful and so small that in 50 years' time, every person would be owning more computing power than it took to put man on the moon, and it would be sitting in your pocket. They were never expecting anything that we have today. Uh, Larry says, yes, they could be preempted at any time, even though a new episode was ready to air. Yeah, they could, the, the network could preempt them all they wanted. But if you didn't have that episode ready for them to show, you were dead. You, you were completely lost as a producer. Completely. Producer's whole job at that point was to make sure that episode got there on time and preferably under budget. So what they could not see back then was what was going to happen with computing. If you asked me in the 1970s or even the 1980s, will you own a tricorder by the time you're 45 or 40? And I would have said, no, no, I'm never going to own a tricorder. I've been in this field for 40 years, and even I did not see that coming. So similarly, anything that we make today is going to prove completely inaccurate because there is something out there that we are not seeing. Just bank on it. There is something out there that we are not seeing. And then there's the fact that this was all essentially baked into Star Trek. Not just the original series, but baked into Star Trek. It came to define Star Trek from the first films through the entire Berman era. It was dialogue heavy, hard science heavy. Uh, sparse and sometimes unimaginative SFX, even on, particularly on the Enterprise, given what CGI could do even then, uh, particularly on Enterprise, I mean, the, the TV series Enterprise, G given what CGI could do then, they should have been more creative. We didn't constantly need for every ship everywhere basically three different angles from which to shoot the ship. That was dictated by the technology filming of the time that was this. That's why we only had a few different angles of the Enterprise because there's only so many places you can put a, a camera this size on a model like this and still have it work good. That is a six foot model back there. It's taking up a third of the entire back wall of the sound stage. You cannot put this camera onto that model in many different ways. This was completely baked into Star Trek. The limited direction in cinematography, well, the camera was static in the original series because they had these big physical 35 millimeter film cameras that were heavy. By comparison, today's modern digital cameras are tiny and capable of much, much more. And in any case, I recently discovered Almost everything is achieved in post anyway, so do whatever you want to with this camera. There is a lot that you can do. Now, the solution to the original series problem. I'm going to walk through this episode in places. Just going to pull out some key moments, and I'm going to give you some examples of the original series problem and what one might have done instead if I were directing this particular episode. Establishing shots of the Orville. 
most of the shots of the ship herself when we are just seeing her in space and not doing anything crazy. Like at the beginning and the end of the episode, before and after act breaks, a commercial breaks, or shots that signify this passage of time. Tend to be variations on the original series, two to three or four establishing shots that were dictated by the technology of that era. There is no reason that you can't do something far more creative. And they did it, by the way, when the shuttle came in for a landing on this episode. They did. Very, very different there. Excuse me. But there's no reason that you cannot do what Abrams did in the movies. Now, I, I think those movies are flawed for different reasons, but he did successfully move Star Trek out of what had been a largely verbal, dialogue-heavy medium and into something that was more driven by what you see. It is something that Star Trek never did. They baked into the entire premise of Star Trek, the way of doing things in the 1960s, even long after they didn't need to do it anymore. Um, yep, actors added in posts. Actors will be AI. Yeah, I'm waiting for that. I'm waiting for that. It's only a matter of time. Um, but there, are, everything's inserted in post now. The lighting is altered in post. Even if you're lighting a real thing on a set, they alter it in post. So embrace it, guys. Go crazy with the camera if you want to. Now, I can give you an example of where they might have done something different about this. If, you know, when they go to land the shuttle on the planet. Okay, that's pretty cool. That was, it was a breaking up planet. It was some nice special effects and all that. But as always, they landed on a flat plane with the, with the door that they needed to get into. Well, I would have tilted it 90 degrees so that they have to, you know, we come in to land and, and we land a certain way. We land in the plane of the ship. But then for them, the moment they step out of it, the gravity changes 90 degrees. So they step out. We see this weird moment when they're 90 degrees to where we think they ought to be. And then the camera shifts so that they're now upright. And what would hand meant a horizontally sitting ship, a shuttle, is now pointed vertically or something like that. So that's the sort of thing that you can do. There's no reason that you have to have these things all in the same uh, plane all the time. You can turn them 90 degrees. It's space, and we have the ability to do that with CGI. We're not limited by this big, giant model in the studio. CGI, we can do damn near anything, so why don't we? It is the original series problem. They have baked in the things that they did in the original series that were dictated solely by technical limitations of the time. There are background characters here. Um, it's something, by the way, that they did frequently. Several directors on the original series did frequently, but not all of them consistently. And that is you should allow your background characters to react to the foreground characters. There are, at any given time, two to four people on the bridge who are there for background purposes. They should be allowed to react to the foreground characters. The foreground characters are often the superior officers. Let them react when their superiors speak. It looks more human that way. They did do that to some extent in uh, Star Trek, the original series. There's a character of Mr. Leslie, who is constantly being put into the background of various shots. This is a guy who, if I, he always reacted to people. And it was a hideously funny thing to watch if you really get him to watch it. Because I have this feeling, if the Enterprise has a rumor mill in the original series, Mr. Leslie is, his main guy, is the main guy. He's the guy who's, he, the, the characters will say, you know, Kirk and Spock will be sitting there four feet away from him talking sort of hushed tones about how they're going to take the ship back in time. And here's the guy that's listening to this going, oh my God, you are not going to believe what they're going to do now. We're going backwards in time. You know, I could just see it because he was reacting to them all the time. Let these guys react. Uh, it looks more human. Let them react to the people who are around them. Don't just have them sort of sitting there automatons and punching their consoles. You know, somebody down here is talking. They could turn and watch, you know, and react. And, and maybe something funny is said, and they, you know, or something like that. Let them react in the background to what's going on. One of the biggest things, beware the static camera. Beware close-ups. Beware shot, reverse shot. Shot, reverse shot is where you have two people having a conversation. And uh, say it's like this. I'm talking to a person. Let's see if I can get the cam angle right. I'm talking to a person this way, right? And so you'll do the shot over their shoulder of me. I'll do all my lines, etc. And then you flip it around. You put the camera behind me. And now you're shooting them talking to me this way. 
That is shot, reverse shot. It is that, close-ups, group shots. These are all things that are carryovers from a time when you had a camera like this that could not be moved very much. That is no longer the case. It is now the case that we have small digital cameras that can be doing anything. So I'm going to give you an example of something I'm talking about. Instead of shot, reverse shot, there's a lot of shot, reverse shot in the scene where Bordas and, and um, his name now, the other guy, are having uh, that conversation over breakfast, and their son is there. Okay, to me, the most important thing in that scene is the kid. Not them and their reactions, it's the kid. If the kid wasn't important, why would they put the kid in there? So instead of doing all those shot reverse shot, I'd have done some dollying a bit. I would have done some dollying around the table and wound up behind the kid with each character on either side of the screen and the kid's head in the foreground moving back and forth as they have their argument. You can do this. It is not required that you sit your camera completely still all the time. I would have done this from the kid's perspective and use that movement, that dollying around from one to the other and then settling on the kid as a dramatic way of telling the story in a visual sense. You need to stay, save this close, static shots for very personal moments. Group shots have the same problems. Um, let me see if I've got something. Yeah, the group shots have the same problems. Uh, they'll take wide shots. You don't need to do wide shots. You needed to do wide shots when your camera was this big and weighed 500 pounds. Now the cameras can go anywhere. Let them go anywhere. You know, take them around. Instead of seeing a big group shot of your crew, wander that camera around as they say their lines. Uh, they do it all the time in other television. It is something that was baked into the original series. Particularly when you get on the major sets, particularly the bridge. Most of the time, that camera can be constantly in motion. Instead of moving from two shots to close-ups and to wide shots and all that, instead we can move from character to character. So, for example, when they in the one scene when they find that ore on the planet, right? Instead of doing close-ups of people or two shots or wide shots, instead, I would maybe try this: start out from an angle from the door of the bridge facing forward. So we're seeing everything on those windows. You know, this whole planet's tearing itself apart. We can just let that run. And we can foreshadow this discovery to some extent, right? So we've, we got this big wide shot. We can see the front of the bridge and people at stations. And so over here at Isaac's station, we might have a couple of those background people who are starting to get more animated and excited. It's like, oh my God, what have we just found here? And then turn to um, Isaac. And then he can say something. But by having it in this big shot, then we can say, over, okay, over here we've got some stuff going on. Let's move in toward that. You keep then Isaac on one side of the screen, Ed on the other side of the screen while they have their exchange about this. And if you need to get reactions from somebody, you know, like uh, at one point Gordon says, uh, you know, wow, free gas. He can turn 90 degrees so we can see the profile of his face down farther in the bridge. But this gives us the ability to give us this very, very cool generally ongoing panoramic shot of the special effects of this thing breaking up. And that would also underscore what they're being told. Can we, Look at that mess out there. Can we actually pick up what we need out of there? Um, that's the sort of thing you can do. You do not have to go shot, reverse shot, close up, two shot, group shot. You can move the camera around. The fact that they don't is because it was baked into Star Trek so bad. But even now, when you can do those things, it doesn't occur to anybody to actually do it. Um, action scenes, in particular, can move a lot. Now, let me give you an example here of where Bordas was revived in sickbay because they had the right idea there. I was immediately struck by it. The cam faded in on the door, and then Ed and Kelly strode in, and the cam starts this nice dolly around the operating room table. But then it's interrupted with a quick dolly the, the other direction, and then shots, close-up shots of people. Not the way I would have done it. Might have worked better is when Ed and Kelly come in, the dolly follows through with them, 
it then we can see the operating room table and the cam can do a complete dolly around the table in one direction and as the thing is going around well we've also got these green shirts in the background right where that's that's just there to make it look busy but it doesn't really work because all they do is just kind of move around in the background instead i'd have three green shirts and no nurse and that thing over Bordis should be capable of making injections that she wants and doing everything the nurse was doing. And she could, uh, the Claire could then be looking over the readouts on that thing as opposed to looking at her handheld. Why do that when you got a big thing full of readouts? And we can have the people in the background moving from station to station or sharing information or doing specific things, but we can have the, them coming in between the camera and it's Dolly and that way it, do, it really does look like something's busy is going on and what i would have things do is claire is the one sitting there on that thing the green shirts are moving around and occasionally getting in the camera's frame and going out again but when she gives them some type of order then we see a reaction from them maybe we see some additional movement from them but having the camera be static is not something we need to do we might even go so far in that sickbay thing as to choose, say we got these three green shirts. Let's put them in charge of different aspects of the body. So there's somebody there for cardiology, there's somebody there for neurology, somebody there for respiratory, something like that. So when Claire says that she wants to have a cardio stimulator, well, we get the person who's in charge of cardio to do that. You know, she's down there going, cardio stimulator, bam. Ah, cardio stimulator, bam. And we can get the reactions and we can get the camera moving with them. We don't have to sit here on things that are dictated by a 1960s technology. You can use cameras in a, more, in a more modern way in Star Trek. There's no reason not to. Um, and then I would end the dolly. If I was going to do it with the dollying around the camera and getting, you know, Claire's yelling things at different people who are then performing the orders that she wants, I would then settle in on a close-up of Bordas's face with, again, one shot here. We've just been dollaring around. And then wind up at Bordas's face while she's doing the whole defib. Do not cut away from that. Wind in up there and then, you know, okay, cortical stim uh, or, you know, whatever it was, uh, cardio stim, uh, clear, ding, clear, ding, and then he wakes up. Um, don't break it up with all that other stuff. Don't go static. When you have an action scene sequence like that, it's perfectly fine to keep the camera moving. The reason that you got those static shots in the original series was because of this. We don't have that anymore. There's no reason to do it. Other shows are constantly doing this type of thing. There's no reason you can't do it here. Today, most of this stuff should be in motion, unless it is a really intense personal moment. Um, you save this stuff for personal moments, not for action moments, but for personal moments. You can have personal moments come out in the middle of action. But for the most part, we want to take advantage of the fact that we've got 2019 technology. You don't have to think about this in terms of what did they do in Star Trek. Other pieces that are affected by the original series problem. Music. And this is to some extent, as I mentioned, a Burma, Burman era Star Trek problem. For some reason, they decided... And you can tell the difference instantly, by the way, if you watch a few episodes of the first season of Star Trek The Next Generation versus later on in the Burman era, you will hear it instantly. They toned down all of the soundtracks. Guys, do not be afraid to be big on this show. You can think about being as big as Murray Gold doing Doctor Who big. That will work on this show. Um, that was another thing that I liked what was going on with the music during the background in sickbay. I watched that scene several times because the beginning of it, I thought they got totally right. The camera was moving. We had a good performance out of Kelly, and the music in the background was good. It was, you know, I was listening to it on a big speaker. It was very good. I liked that very much. Do not be afraid to keep doing that. There was also some ticking countdown stuff going on in the music uh, towards the end. Do not be afraid to do that. Um, do that all the time. Make it bigger. On this one, the original series scores are a very good thing to emulate, and don't be afraid to do it. The techno babble. Keep it to a minimum. Now, I know that's tough for a hard science, science fiction show like this, but it can get out of control. 
Um, and when it does, I think what you need to have, because you can do this in a comedy sort of like this, Mercer can just say, hey, wait a minute, slow down, put that to me in Captain Dummy talk. And then the viewer will get what they need to know, and it can be scientifically accurate. They just don't need to get an excruciating detail about it. And they won't get confused that way. They'll understand what's going on without getting confused. When it comes to the dated technology, uh, said technology always dates, there is nothing you can do about it. We are looking forward as best we can from where we are right now, but we're going to get it wrong. We are going to get it wrong. And this show is in danger of becoming very dated very quickly. They need to be using something like hollow displays, or better, everywhere. And they should have physical controls for emergency backup, which would have worked here, by the way, and been more, more dramatic. Because there's a point at which Molay says, Captain, we've lost helm control. All right. Okay, what we should see then, if you're using hollow displays and everything that he's manipulating in the air, for the most part, then what we should see is the hollow displays go dark and he starts using physical controls with buttons and switches because that's what you need in something like a helm of a starship. If things go completely south and your cool displays aren't working, you need buttons and switches. So imagine the change in dramatic tone by virtue of he's you know, fooling around as usual with all the stuff in front of him and then it's all gone, just disappears in the midair and he's got nothing left. Oh my God, Captain, we've just lost helm control. And then he starts messing with the physical controls. Maybe there's a joystick. Um, you know, so you can, it can make the scene even more dramatic by when that stuff just poof disappears, when it's not working and you have to resort to physical controls. But by having okudograms, which is what they've basically got now, they're going to date very badly very quickly because we are about to move beyond that technology. We are probably not moving into hollow displays. What we are probably moving into are displays that only you will see. We'll be wearing something like data shades, data contact lenses, in which we will see windows and applications up in our fields of view that no one but us can see. That's where we're probably headed for. That's frankly what I would be aiming for if I were doing something like that on this show. That with the backup of actual physical controls. Uh, Larry Larry says, a steering wheel. I don't know necessarily you'd use a steering wheel. In point of fact, you might, you might have it come down to be he'd pull out like a game controller. You know, because it's a comedy, you can do that to some extent. We say, ah, you know, joysticks, old school, game controller type of thing. You know, something like that. But it would work out well in terms of it being, you know, an emergency thing where we have to have our, uh, sorry, I'm trying to hook this back on, where we have to have our manual controls. But if they stay with the flat surface computer displays, they're going to look very, very dated very quickly. We're about to move beyond that. That is my general suggestion for them. Stop thinking in terms of Star Trek, the original, excuse me, the original series. You can still tell great stories. Don't get me wrong. You don't really have to change the stories. All you have to do is different types of direction, different types of cinematography, taking advantage of what the camera can do now as opposed to what it could do in 1966. You have to acknowledge the fact that things have moved on, and I think you can make a more exciting show that way. And at the same time, you know, particularly the music, I would really like to see the music get bigger. I would really like to see the music get bigger. There's no reason you can't on this show. Um, go for it, guys. You know, let your composers off the leash. You know. Excuse me. Not a steering wheel necessarily, although it might be amusing. Um, you know, maybe for a helmsman. Eh, it would be kind of silly because of the three-dimensional. But I did get a kick out of um, in uh, Star Trek VI when the Klingons have an actual wheel by which they helm the ship. I don't know necessarily you could get away with that. A spaceship's got a Y and a Z axis, X, Y, and Z axis as opposed to just X and Y. Um, but, you know, you could do something, like I say, with a, with a uh, joystick or even a game controller. You know, I could see that. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, 
the control and manipulation of minds.